Hi, Nancy. Hey, Shane. I have a question. As of always, course. did you play board games growing up? Of course, we love to play um, Scrabble and Boggle. Boggle. Boggle's great, actually. We played that fairly recently, too. Oh, my too. God. I haven't thought about Boggle forever. We used to play it on the beach. It was so fun. Oh. It's a good beach game. I've never played Boggle in my whole <gasps> life. Do you oh, know yeah. you do? And you, sorry, like, Lauren's shake up the too. letters and you make words? Oh, yes. This does uh, sound familiar. Uh, what about you? What, what was one of yours? Uh, we played a lot of Clue, mm-hmm. you know, um, but one I really did love was Battleship. That is a good one. Battleship. You sunk my Battleship. <laughs> the best part was making the explosion noises, like, you know, when your Battleship gets sunk. You guys didn't do that? I guess not. No. <laughs> but you put the little tiki things in. Tiki? <laughs> okay. All right. Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompy. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. So, Nancy, were you, were you any good at Battleship with your tikis? <laughs> My tikis? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Do I remember anything from childhood? No. Yeah. Of course, there's a reason why we're talking about this. We're going to bring in our Cold War resident expert, I know. Lauren LaPuma. So many episodes. Hello. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Lauren, why are we talking about this? Well, Battleship was a really fun game, but actually... Is. It is. It You're is. right. Not was. Is. It still exists. <laughs> I just haven't played it in a while. Back in the 40s, the Navy actually did a like real battleship scenario. Did you guys know about this? No. No. That's what we're going to hear about today. So a few months ago, a couple of our colleagues who you'll hear on this interview, Josh and Sarah, they interviewed Art Trembanis, who is an oceanographer and geologist at the University of Delaware. And he told us this amazing story about how the Navy actually kind of did their own battleship scenario back in the 40s. They wanted to test what would happen to a fleet of naval ships if a nuclear bomb went off really close to it. Like, would the ship sink? Would they be okay? Fascinating. Would they vaporize? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Would they still exist? That's All really right. interesting. Uh, my name is Art Trembanis. My background is uh, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, so I was always surrounded by the water and uh, the Puget Sound and the ocean and the mountains. So I always had an interest in, in the environment. And I, I'm half Greek and half Norwegian, so there were seagoing people on both sides of the family. I just always had a fascination at, with the oceans. I was one of the kids, I would grow up Saturday mornings watching National Geographic Explorer, Bob Ballard looking for the Titanic and things like that. So Art just finished up a project mapping the crater left behind from these nuclear bomb tests that the Navy did back in the summer of 46. Um, In July 46, they did two tests. Like I said, they wanted to test what would happen to a fleet of ships if a nuclear bomb went off really close by. So they did one test in the air where they detonated a bomb um, in the air above the water. And a second test they did underwater where they suspended a bomb from the bottom of a boat. So they had to go somewhere remote, obviously. So they picked this little tiny island called Bikini Atoll, which is in the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. And this whole thing was called Operation Crossroads. In the middle of the vast Pacific Ocean lies the tiny coral atoll of Bikini. It is here that Joint Army-Navy Task Force One will conduct the tests with the atom bomb. Not since the discovery of gunpowder has the world wondered over the ability of man to create such an agent of destruction. I guess about a year ago or so, we got contacted by uh, a couple of marine archaeologist colleagues, uh, Dr. Jim Delgado and Dr. Mike Brennan, who are both at Search Inc. And, um, and Dr. Del- Delgado is one of the world's leading experts on on shipwrecks. Uh, even. But Jim had led a team with the National Park Service in the late 80s and early 90s when they could first get into to Bikini, when it was first sort of cleared enough that they could try to get divers in. And had written a book called Ghost Fleet of Bikini. It's about the ships that were sunk there. And so they came at it from definitely that perspective of wanting to understand the site from the maritime uh, archaeology, what are the conditions of the ships there, and um, you know, needed to find some team that could do kind of the mapping uh, of it. You know, I've known about Bikini uh, all my life. Again, I, I grew up really into uh, uh, Japanese monster movies, so Godzilla films and things like that. 
Godzilla, king of the monsters, alive, surging up from the depths of the sea on a tidal wave of terror to wreak vengeance on mankind. Godzilla, king of the monsters, it's alive. And bikini factors into the the myth story. It's sort of the where Godzilla comes from, or that the testing right, he's radioactively uh, endowed and becomes this huge uh, lizard that starts stalking Tokyo. Yeah. And, and, it, and, that, and that's a whole fascinating thing as well, just because, you know, you realize that for Japanese culture, Godzilla was, in ways, this manifestation of, you know, a culture trying to come to reason with the horrors that they had experienced firsthand and then seeing more of them. And there was a Japanese ship that, a fishing vessel that was radiated on by fallout from the 1954 tests in Bikini. And that, again, that's really when that time is sort of, of those, those movies were starting to then be developed in response to that. So bikini is really famous because it's where the name for bikini bathing suits comes from. Do you, do you know what like the etymology of that is? I do, actually. So, well, the island was called bikini mm-hmm. by the native inhabitants, but the people who designed the bikini bathing suit picked that name because um, they were inspired by like the destruction of the bomb tests that were going on there and they thought it was kind of the the like fashion equivalent like this femme fatale <laughs> woman who just slays everything in her path <laughs> with her very sexy bathing suit that is so much better than anything I could have ever imagined I know right but on the real bikini island um, obviously there were people living there when the US went to test these bombs and so the first thing they had to do was evacuate these inhabitants. So before we get there, um, let's take us back in time, okay? So what would someone see, or, or, or prior to the Navy arriving and doing these tests, tell us a little bit about Bikini, about the people who live there, what was society like? You know, Bikini today you know, is one of you know, in many of the islands in the, the Marshall Islands chains. Uh, is a series of atolls, so it's the remnant of a volcano, and now sort of the tops eroded off, and it sticks up from about 4,000 meters water depth, sort of sheer sided, a very, very steep volcano, and then the island is rimmed by these coral little islands around the atoll, so it's a series of these little palm tree lines, sort of, you know, what you'd imagine in the, you know, musical like South Pacific or something. And so, uh, you know, what you would see now is, you know, or, or, or then would have been this idyllic setting. It was populated at the time with about 160 some uh, Bikinians. They were living there, you know, fishing the lagoon, fishing the uh, the outer waters. And then in '46, they had you know Navy and military personnel coming and, and asking them if they could borrow their island for the good of mankind was was the catchphrase at, at that time. But but I don't think they had any idea that it would be that long that there's you know still refugees from their own island. So what happens after the point um, after World War II, and we know that we're leading up to these other atomic tests. What are the Marshallese told, or or, hmm. or, or, or how does a how does the United States military apparatus move in and decide that? They're going to do um, these these tests in this idyllic, beautifully untouched environment, and yeah. why this area? Well, I mean, it's it's so profoundly remote that that's you know really you know why they looked at and the military went through a process of vetting and, and considering different islands. I, I remember reading at one point that there were some discussions they considered maybe we'll do it somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico or somewhere in the Caribbean, and then they worried that it might be too close to valuable population centers. So they looked at the Marshall Islands, and then they looked at different islands with within them. And Bikini kind of fell into this nice sort of uh, optimal zone. It was only a two, two and a half hour flight from Kwajalein where we had a base. It had a large lagoon, easily approachable from the south, a fairly large entrance for it because they knew they wanted to amass all these ships to put the bomb on display. But it also had a small, there were other islands that had more of an indigenous population. So it was a small enough one that they felt they could more easily uh, move them. And, and the military swept in and, you know, within short order, moved them out and then started the process of a assembling this huge, incredible fleet, not only of ships that were there for the testing, but then all the testing apparatus, the instrumentation, the, the cameras, half of the film on the planet they assembled to document what was going on. Half of the film on the planet. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, the, the estimates were that of the available film film material that existed on the planet, that half of it was assembled in Bikini to document this. Numerous towers have been erected on Bikini Atoll. Within these steel structures will be housed the remotely controlled photographic, electronic, and other scientific instruments that will automatically record the results of the blast. Atop some of these towers, encased in huge lead vaults, 
cameras have been strategically placed to capture as much detail as possible. I mean, this is 1946, so arguably there's not as much film as there may be today, although we've largely gone away from film and it's all digital. But it just speaks to the fact that they were setting up cameras, uh, remote cameras, high-speed uh, cameras, uh, high-altitude cameras, and, and they, they really wanted to document this because... I mean, if you look at what the previous three atomic bombs, you had the Trinity test in the desert, which was done in secret. And then you have the, the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, you know, the document, it was not like we were able, they were going to be able to set up instrumentation and, and, and capture what was going on there. So the testing in Operations Crossroads really became an opportunity to put the bomb on display. And they wanted to document it and capture that to the fullest extent that they could. Anchored in the sheltered waters of the Bikini Lagoon below is an array of almost every type of naval vessel used in the past war. Here is the venerable old carrier Saratoga, the battleship Pennsylvania, flagship of World War I. USS Nevada was designated the target ship and strategically placed. The primary purpose of Test Baker was to secure precise ship damage and instrumentation measurements resulting from an atomic bomb explosion just under the surface of the water. The basic premise which determined the target ship orientation for Test Baker was the Joint Chiefs of Staff Directive, requiring that the ships be so disposed as to secure graded damage from maximum to minimum. Of the 84 target vessels, 40 ships were placed within one mile of the bomb detonation point, and 20 ships were placed within one half mile. Um, so what were they hoping to learn by testing these bombs, and what did they end up learning? They wanted to learn how ships would react and respond to nuclear weapons. Uh, what would happen if, if a Navy was approaching and you set one off? Would it you know, knock out the ships? Would it sink them all? So I think a lot of it in terms of the military justification was, you know, how, how would the ships respond? And so they assembled an array of different ships from huge aircraft carriers like the Saratoga and the Independence to battleships like the Arkansas, Nevada, and then, you know, submarines and, and attack transporters. It was, just, it was like the Noah's Ark of, of uh, ship testing. I mean, they, although they brought more than two, it was, you know, they'd have five or six and, and arrayed out to, to look at distances uh, from it. And uh, they had animals uh, there on the decks of these sh ships. They, they had pigs and sheep, and uh, they wanted to see how they, they would respond to the heat, the pressure, and the radiation. They put munitions. Uh, they had, you know, bombs and, 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 and missiles and things on, on the decks. They wanted to see would it trigger, you know, other things to, to go off. These specialists, with their strange and complicated scientific instruments, will make hundreds of tests measuring temperatures, pressures, and radioactivity and other experiments analyzing the effects of the bomb on aircraft, armament, ordnance gear, and other paraphernalia. Tied to the decks of the ships in Bikini Lagoon are samples of mechanical equipment and articles of every type and description that the Army and Navy used during the past war. Airplanes, jeeps, food, clothing, trucks, and armored cars. Everything from canned milk to tanks will be subjected to the blast. Flown from Rongerick to witness the historical event is King Judah, ruler of Bikini. It was he who unselfishly gave his island to the United States in order that these experiments could be conducted. So it was really fascinating. I mean, as a scientist, I, I really look at it and I'm, yeah, that's, that's a well-crafted, frighteningly, you know, sort of uh, sophisticated and precise sort of uh, scientific plan that, that they executed on a scale that I couldn't have imagined trying to put together. Fifteen. Ten. Five. Four. Three, two, one, fire. Tell us, um, if you're a, a member of, of the Navy and you're watching the test, mm. what do you see as Baker goes off? Yeah, so... Um 
there were there was something more than like forty thousand personnel that had uh, been around there because you needed all these personnel to position and move all these ships to set up all all this equipment. They, they had ships positioned within the lagoon and outside of the lagoon, so far enough distance away. Sailors were either told to avert their eyes or given sort of welder level type glasses or the bite bright flash because we would have seen this sort of blindingly you know sun powerful sun flash that came from it and then depending how far away you were then you'd hear this you know this blast from it and then they start to see this column of water rise up and first a dome sort of comes up from the surface because instantly the water is vaporized from the intense uh, temperatures and that creates a bubble and then the pressure of the water around it collapses on that bubble and then this column of water starts to rise up, shoots up, taking with it two million tons of, of, of water, sand, pulverized coral, whatever happens to be around there, about a mile up in, in, into the air. These pictures of the ascending water column show the expanding cloud of spray at the base of the column moving outward and enveloping the ships in the target array. Great quantities of radioactive water from the column descended upon the decks of the nearby vessels, and ship hulls a mile away were drenched by the wall of foaming water. Two million tons. Yeah, I mean, these are pretty rough, you know, rough numbers, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge column of, of water that goes rising up that has now been radiated, and now these droplets then start falling down, and, and large waves start to spread like a tsunami across across the surface, washing up, inundating some, some islands, washing up over onto Bikini Island as well, pushing ships aside like they're bathtub toys, and sinking the first day about six ships. Ships were recorded as, as sinking, including the, the Saratoga. This highly lethal spray was intensely radioactive, partly by reason of the neutron bombardment of the sodium in the salt contained in seawater. An expanding cloud of spray and fog several hundred feet high may be seen moving out from the center of the detonation. This cloud eventually covered the entire target array. Waves outside the water column about 1,000 feet from the center of the explosion, were 80 to 100 feet in height. Three major ships were sunk. The Arkansas immediately, the aircraft carrier Saratoga after seven and a half hours, and the Japanese battleship Nagato after five days. Several small craft were also sunk. The Navy was really unprepared for just how destructive the Baker test was on those ships in the lagoon. <laughs> It's hard to that's hard to think about these days. Like now that we know, I guess it's about the point, right? They had no idea. They had no idea. Yeah. At this point, only three nuclear bombs had ever been oh, wow. set off. Yeah. But what happened was when the water column shot up and then started falling again on the ships, the water was so highly radioactive that it like covered all the ships. They all had to be deliberately sunk. They couldn't be decontaminated. And so they had originally started off with 84 ships for this test, and only nine of them could have been salvaged after that. Oh, jeez. Yeah. And the bomb, like I said, the bomb was suspended below a boat of its own to be detonated, and no remnant of that boat has ever been found. I want to play this version of Battleship, like <laughs> the, the radioactive bomb version of Battleship. I know. It's crazy, right? That's wild. So, okay. But so how does art fit into all of this? Right. So what art's doing now is mapping the seafloor around Bikini and seeing if they can still see evidence of the crater and, you know, what is the, are the long-lasting effects of this explosion on the seafloor. They wanted to see, you know, what the shipwrecks looked like, what the, if they could see the crater, was the seafloor changed in some way? So they used sonar, and what they've seen so far is that the crater is still there. It's about 700 meters wide, so a little less than half a mile. And there are these really, like, subtle waveform features that Art sees on the seafloor that he thinks now are a signature of this type of underwater nuclear explosion. So can you tell us what sort of evidence you saw of the effects of the Baker test underwater? Sure. Well, the first thing we see when we, we map out this area, what they refer to as the Operation Crossroads Kill Zone. 
when we're when we're doing this mapping, we call this mowing the lawn. And so we're sort of dully going back and forth, back and forth, reciprocal lines, you know, like mowing the lawn. I don't enjoy mowing the lawn. I happily pay somebody else to do that. And yet to do my work, I have to mow the lawn back and forth. And, and I remember it as, as we were starting to map in the Baker um, area, that we were starting to see the emergence of what clearly had to be the crater. And I remember it as we made a pass and we were clearly going through what was the middle of that crater that... I could look up and realize that photo that just had always been this like, okay, yeah, so that's bikini we're going to. That we were there. It kind of gave me shivers to think we, we were there in the middle of, of that column and it was still there. It was still speaking to us. One of the first things we see is these scattered shipwrecks. Um, you know, there's a dozen ships within, within that zone and, and dotted around. And, and usually in my line of work, you see one major ship or two, you're pretty impressed. There's 12 within a pretty compact area. It's about one and a half times the size of Central Park. So, you know, I try to imagine myself sort of walking through Central Park and then seeing this, this landscape of ships. And then smack dab in the middle of this zone is this hulking crater that just sort of stares at you like the eye of Sauron or just this massive dent that, that some Marvel superhero has just punched into the planet and what surprised us was that that Baker crater is still very visible we can see we know it's a Baker crater because it, it looks unlike anything else on the seabed there and it's right in the zone where everything was meant to occur and we can see some ships that are still inside that crater or right along the edge uh, of that crater and it speaks to us of how generally calm the lagoon is. Normally, if we were looking at what would happen from a storm or some sort of impact, you might erode in one area, but but then the sediment that is eroded, the sand, silt, whatever, if it's eroded in one place, is moved somewhere else. And so you you just try to account for it. You just try to say, okay, it's been redistributed. Uh, here we have a, a sediment imbalance in, in that deficit that we see the crater, but we don't have an equivalent accounting for the sediment that would have gone into the crater because some of it was just vaporized and, and then got carried away in the mushroom cloud and in the column into the atmosphere. And so part of the reason why it's still there is that not everything came and filled back in. Some of it did. We see that the crater f floor is flat and we, we would expect it to have kind of more of a concave. Kind yeah, of more thing? of a concave sort of pro progression to some sort of apex. And instead it's like, well, it's a bowl that's partially filled in. And that's because all that 2 million tons of sediment, water, and coral fragments that went up came back down. Some of it did at least. And, and so it partially uh, filled it in. As we started to stare at the crater, we realized it wasn't just flat, smooth, just, you know, salad bowl. So it wasn't like a glacier surface that was flattened. Because I know that during some of the um, Trinity tests, actually, there were glasses made from yes, sand. Yes, yes, yes. They go trinitite. Uh, they, they call this sort of fused silica. And they've found some on beaches near uh, Hiroshima where the silica and the sand will get melted by that uh, blast. Here is a different composition, firstly, because we uh, somebody had suggested, well, maybe we'll find some of that you know, nuclear uh, glass. But here in Bikini, it's, even though there's a, there's a volcano deep, it's a volcano capped by several hundred meters of coral and calcium carbonate sand. So the, the sand, the silt, those fragments are calcium carbonate, so they don't fuse into a glass like that. They ignite, they'll burn under some of those temperatures. And so that's why we think probably some of that sediment was lost. But when we were staring at the Baker crater, we could see that it, yeah, it wasn't just this smooth sort of surface. It was mottled and, and ruffled and, and textured in ways. It, it almost looked like, oh boy, I thought it kind of looked like maybe somebody took a cauliflower head and pushed it into the bottom or left a kind of an impression on it or, or like, a, like a carnation or a rose kind of opening up. So I have to wonder, um, your friends, your colleagues, your family, you're going to a site that was uh, obviously used as a, a nuclear test site. Was there a lot of concern expressed? And, or, and if there was concern, was it founded? Was this still a site that was hot, so to speak, radioactively speaking? Or had you know, enough time passed that it was um, a safe zone? 
Yeah, there was definitely concern uh, when I first, you know, told my wife and my parents, uh, you know, that we were we were looking to go to Bikini. You know, I think, you know, they want to know, well, is it even safe to go go back there? Uh, littler kids, a little younger than mine, but uh, you know, I think, oh, well, you're going to go see where SpongeBob lives. Uh, you know, you know, when we think about the ways in which Bikini remains in our sort of collective social world, we think of tiny bathing suits or SpongeBob or Godzilla, and and all of those sort of keep bikini in our minds, but don't capture really, really what it was like there. We dropped down, we were we were tied up to a mooring off of the Saratoga. And as soon as I put my face under the water, I could see the ship beneath me and stretched out further than I could see in either either direction. It was so immense that, you know, you just get tired trying to trying to swim and sort of cover it. Just uh, the scale of it was just uh, astounding. Are there any environmental impacts besides, obviously, after the immediate aftermath, you know, 73 years later, what does it look like? Yeah, so there definitely are some things for, for concern. One of the things that, that we encountered just even in our mapping operations on the surface was uh, every once in a while we'd get this pungent uh, caustic smell in our noses and I could know immediately without even looking up from the monitor, was, oh, we must be near the Saratoga or we're near the Nagato. Some of these ships still 73 years later are leaking fuel from them. At the time when the blast went off, there was tremendous release of fuel and material that caught fire you know, within, within the lagoon, but, and it's still continuing to this day. All of the target ships were loaded with ammunition and fuel oil, varying from full wartime loading to 10% of normal. These ships were prepared for a combat simulation. So they actually, as a variable, they adjusted fuel levels in different ships. They adjusted munitions levels because they wanted to see, well, might there be a certain combination where if you're too close to a blast, it's going to trigger fires and sympathetic explosions and that, you know, munitions might otherwise uh, catch fire. And that means now that those ships carried all that with them to the seabed. So when we went diving on on the Saratoga, we could see, you know, here's a torpedo, here's gun mounts, here's things like that. And so that presents a risk to divers who would go in, into these uh, into these areas that they could be exposed to those. Uh, and these weren't dummy bombs; these were you know actual weapons that have still potentially viable explosives or other chemical reagents in them. Visible on the surface of Bikini Lagoon is an oil slick leaking from ruptured oil tanks, principally from the battleship Arkansas. And the other thing we realize is that, you know, these ships may still have within them additional fuel and oils uh, in them, and we are seeing that they are deteriorating, certainly even, you know, over time, but even since the last group that studied them when Dr. Delgado and the National Park Service came in 8990, we can now compare our findings, our measurements to their drawings and their their measurements and we can see that the ships have continued to degrade. And at what point they'll really hit a tipping point and maybe, you know, start to, you know, spill open like pretty nasty pinatas, we don't know, but that is going to happen and that's going to happen not just for these ships but for World War II wrecks throughout the Pacific and Atlantic. So from that, it sounds like it's fairly uh, pessimistic that the the generations of Bikinians who came after the folks who were evacuated would have any hope of returning to their ancestral home. Well, I, you know, they had tried to reintroduce the Bikinians in the 70s, actually, and, and they discovered that it was still too hot and they were getting all sorts of uh, sicknesses. We know that the DOE station there continues to monitor conditions on the on the ground. While there are ample fish in the lagoon and offshore that they could subsist on, one of the other major sources of food are from coconuts and also coconut crabs. And we know that there's a bioaccumulation in the soil of radiation that works into the coconuts and then bioaccumulates also in the coconut crabs. And so, you know, for that, they couldn't subsist off of, of that, which is an important part of their diet. And I think the other thing that's happened, and this is, this is something that happens with any sort of diaspora uh, and, and refugee sort of cultures, they're now two, three, maybe, you know, four generations removed from the, the, the Bikinians who live there. I, I, I'm not sure if there's, there may be a handful of maybe octogenarians who were children, you know, when, when they left. And so I think it's very difficult for, for them to try to entice 
the the young bikinians the young marshallese i mean there's there's a lot of fleeing going on within the martial islands as well the marshallese coming to uh, hawaii and in, into the us where where we have they have access for them and so i think it'd be very difficult i think a lot of those cultural things have been lost the navigations the fishing techniques and things like that and so i think you know perhaps more even so than some of the the environmental things which eventually will be good enough for i think we probably have severed you know, the, you know my, my sense is we've probably severed the ability for them to get back or to want to go back. For the Bikinis, for the Marshallese, I think prob- one, of, one of the ways that, in which I think they feel that their sacrifice had some meaning is that even though they gave up their islands, their culture in many ways that's been lost, that sacrifice has at least, knock on, on wood, we haven't had any nuclear war because of it, even though the testing has has continued in some ways. It wasn't even lost on people at the time that this sort of dichotomy between this the beautiful, you know, idyllic Pacific island and the atrocities of what we were unleashing on it. In fact, the comedian Bob Hope said that at the end of the war, we found the one place on the earth that had been untouched by war and blew it to hell. And, you know, humorous as that is, there's some truth to that. We definitely left my team and myself personally, realizing that this didn't just happen in the past and those testing were done. It's continuing. The impacts from that test, the ripples, the bed forms, you know, have, have continued physically, literally, they continue there. And figuratively in what they've done to the people that they displace. And, and not only the bikinis, because there were many sailors, there were many military personnel who were tragically, you know, harmed by the radiation because they were told to go back into the lagoon and get onto these ships and wash them down and scrub them down and gather instruments and samples and things, and they carry those lasting effects, and many of them suffered you know, radiation sicknesses, cancers 20, 30 you know, years later. And they also were you know, unknowing you know, victims of this. And so I think Bikini still can speak to us in terms of the, the evidence and the conditions that are there. And, and that for us to know that these tests and these weapons, those stockpiles, those weapons still exist. And so maybe it's important for us to realize that, you know, we, we think the operations crossroads and these testing ended for, for the Marshallese, for the, for the military personnel involved there. They're still living that. They're still living in the shadow of, of what that testing was. I'll never think about bikinis in quite the same way. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I mean, I guess... For that matter, for that matter, battleship. Yeah, like, real life battleship, man. Yeah. Now it takes on a whole new like I know. gravitas when you play the game. Oh, absolutely. I really do want to get like a, a battleship now and ha- somehow like customize it. Like not so much the radio. I think they make part, sounds but... now. The game. Really? I think that that was like an invention oh. when we after our child. So you don't have to make them with your with your mouth anymore. No. Yeah, you'd actually press a button and then make a sound, an actual <laughs> sound. That's no fun. I like making the sound effects. <laughs> Just. Just take the batteries out. It'll be fine. Okay. Good idea. <laughs> all right, all. That's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks so much to Josh and Sarah for bringing us this story. And, of course, to Art for sharing his work with us. Uh, this episode was produced and mixed by Lauren. AG, you would love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review us yes. um, on Apple Podcasts. Um, write a review. That's really would be wonderful. Um, and you can it. listen to us wherever you get your podcasts and at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time.